And so the topic for today should be an interesting one. It has to do a lot with what uh, us at Into the Block we've been specializing uh, throughout the past few years, which is bringing institutions into DeFi. Um, and so we will talk about some of the barriers to that and how we as an industry can uh, help unlock institutional access into DeFi. So um, this is the agenda for today. We'll talk first about the risks and losses in DeFi. So you guys have probably heard of uh, the many exploits and incidents that have happened in DeFi. We'll cover some of the key stats um, on this and uh, why you should focus on economic risk management as one of the main risk vectors. Uh, and we'll divide that within the three types of protocols. So lending protocols, collateralized deposition stablecoins, which is the most popular type of uh, DeFi stablecoin and also uh, automated market makers such as Uniswap and Curve. So before we dive into it, a uh, quick update about Into the Block. Um, we launched um, already a few weeks ago. Um, some of the metrics that we'll share today will be about this. Um, the risk radar for Go. Um, so Go is the, the collateralized that position stablecoin backed by deposits in the Yavi protocol. Uh, they've already accumulated um, over 50 million in deposits, 23 million or so in, in Go supply. Uh, and we cover metrics there, uh, which we'll use um, uh, throughout the presentation. And similarly, we also launched it for Curve. Uh, we'll be discussing a lot of those metrics throughout the, the presentation. Um, and coming up, uh, this is a bit of a teaser, um, we've been working on this for a, a few months now. It's this new section at Into the Block uh, we are calling Perspectives that dives into market uh, segments or key upgrades or areas that are quite interesting in a comparative way that you know previously at Into the Block wasn't possible. So here on the left, we see, for instance, uh, part of what will be in our stablecoin dashboard. Uh, comparing, you know, the the volume, the market cap, and many other things that we'll have there, uh, which will be very insightful for for those uh, into the block users. And then on the right, uh, I have one of the metrics that I've used been using the most, which is transactions across layer twos. <clears throat> for instance, we see base dominating recently, and uh, we also monitor the the adoption rate, the new users being brought to these platforms. So make sure to to keep an eye out for those. Um, we should be announcing uh, officially in the next few weeks. So without further ado, let's dive into the main topic. Um, so DeFi is risky. That there's no denying that. Um, but there is little uh, consensus on how this these risks can be approached. Uh, I would classify them within two main categories: technical risks and economic risks. Uh, technical risk, as the name imply, has to do with the programs and operational security that um, these underlying protocols operate on top of. So the main vector here is the smart contract exploits. Uh, you know, essentially a loophole that a smart contract that isn't supposed to be used in a given way is used um, to the advantage of a potential attacker. And then there's also uh, issues with potential issues with the ownership of these smart contract addresses, um, which are typically operated through a multi-sig. Uh, if an attacker gets access to the addresses, then they can execute um, many types of transactions uh, that may not be uh, purposefully uh, there for that. Uh, and then a bit more nuanced and complicated, but uh, arguably more important are the economic risks within them. In the most general way possible, these have to do with supply demand imbalances. Uh, and we'll go into further depth, of course, into these. But some of the most common examples include uh, the manipulation of collateral prices uh, such that you're able to borrow more than you should be. These are also called uh, Oracle manipulation attacks. Then there's de-pegging events where an asset is supposed to be pegged to another, crashes, uh, and in some cases doesn't recover, like UST. 
Uh, and there's also the price divergences within assets and pools, which can lead to uh, losses in the way of impermanent loss and, and others. So these types of risk vectors can then be, um, you know, perpetuated through uh, attack, through these types of uh, attacks. So an economic attack is essentially the exploiting of economic risks, typically by an external party. Uh, hacks is technical risks exploited also typically by external parties, whereas rock pools are um, generally the internal, so the team uh, taking advantage of some of uh, the, the code being giving them access that, you know, maybe the users didn't anticipate, like withdrawing funds from a smart contract that, that wasn't supposed to, they weren't supposed to be able to access. And here comes the interesting part. Uh, we did a breakdown of uh, all, well, not all, but uh, over 100 exploits that have happened. Uh, all of the largest ones uh, we have covered in an internal database at Into the Block. So um, in over 100 exploits, uh, unsurprisingly, most of the number of incidents have been technical. So about 69%, 24% uh, are economic, and uh, there's a small segment where there's a combination of both a technical breach and an economic imbalance that leads to, to losses to depositors. Uh, over time, um, this may not feel like it, but uh, DeFi losses for these incidents have actually been trending downwards, particularly the past few quarters. Um, last quarter, so Q2, we had the lowest amounts of losses to these uh, incidents since Q1 2021. I, I think actually even lower. Um, so as the bear market uh, has come and you know the remaining DeFi protocols have become more sturdy, we're seeing less loss losses over time, which is good news for the industry. And of the losses that have taken place, like the dollar value of them, um, actually most of them derive from economic risk factors. So over 90%. So this is including Terra, which makes up you know 50 out of the total 60 billion by far the largest um, you know, economic collapse the industry have seen. But if we exclude Terra, uh, it's still about 50-50. Um, and this is excluding uh, impermanent loss as well, um, which there's reports that there's been uh, billions lost uh, in that as well, depending on the time horizon. So it's it's not included because being impermanent, it, it does vary a lot over time uh, what those losses are. If we compare it by types of protocol, the ones that have been exploited the most are lending protocols. So 30, about a third of the 110 uh, incident sample that, that we had uh, bridges then we see don't uh, have like there's not that many bridge attacks but in terms of losses uh, they're the largest right after algorithmic stable coins um, then Texas there's a quite a few number of incidents but not as many losses and here there's there's a segment of others where there's um, a few losses but uh, algorithmic stable coins it's been a handful of attacks but some of the largest ones uh, including also iron finance have been in that uh, segment so we've you know confirmed that DeFi is indeed very risky and naturally this is a barrier to entry for any institution looking into the space that may get worried you know uh, there's so many losses that people have gone through in the space so what can we do as an industry to help attract institutional adoption? And we believe that first and foremost, we should uh, approach it through the lens of transparency. This is one of the inherent benefits of blockchain technology that we can monitor these uh, key risk metrics uh, real time and have those publicly available for anyone looking to, to review this. Uh, and this is uh, essential to be able to build um, trust in the space and, and over time should make it more sturdy of, of an industry. Then there is, of course, risk management that needs to be employed. So this is where I believe that some of the DeFi protocols that are you know still doing well have gotten better over time, which is um, automating responses to risky conditions. Before, you know, when DeFi was completely new, or even the protocol developers themselves didn't know some of the adverse conditions that could develop. 
and over time they've got gotten uh, gained expertise and also able been able to automate a lot of the responses in a, a lot more quick fashion than previously in 2021 or 22. And finally, uh, there's also a need for the capital allocators on top to have a layer of customized risk management on top uh, of the protocols to be able to adjust their individual positions to the protocol itself. Uh, and what I mean by this is essentially for an institution that's a lot more risk averse, they may need to exit a protocol if there's like a 2% depegging of the price of the stablecoin, whereas, you know, your average DGEN would be able to tolerate like a 10% depeg or impermanent loss. So that's why there's need for a, an extra layer of customization on top of the already uh, more resilient um, DeFi protocols. Um, and now I'll, I'll discuss uh, economic risk management, which, you know, not only makes up for most of the losses in DeFi, but also has a lot more room for mitigation than a technical incident. So going back to what I was just saying about institutional um, layer of risk management, if there's a technical exploit, frankly, there's little that these institutions could do. But if there's an economic imbalance, there's typically leading indicators to this and also uh, a set of triggers that can be placed to automatically disassemble positions with your capital and mitigate losses. So first, um, there's three core components to understanding uh, economic risks in DeFi. Um, firstly, of course, the supply and demand dynamics. So who are the players uh, depositing in both sides, uh, well, interacting in both sides of the equation? So if we look at uh, a DEX, for instance, who are the liquidity providers that are, act as market makers uh, in these markets and who are the traders? And more importantly, um, what value and incentives do they have to be using these protocols? Um, and that's easier to determine than the who, since, of course, it's all pseudonymous. So it's probably best to focus on those incentives and how could they potentially be uh, altered if the if the protocol adjusts. This leads me to my second point, which is the mechanism design. So how does a protocol, a protocol operate? Um, and what are the formulas in place to make sure that the protocol uh, creates a balance? So typically in DeFi, we were used to mostly peer to pool protocols, which essentially means that someone deposits into a pool where there's multiple other depositors and there's inherent formulas built in that rebalance the, the protocol. So the most noteworthy out of those is the uh, X times Y equals K from automated, automated market makers, which rebalance the liquidity um, from one asset into another. And this is important to understand how it works um, to be able to you know prepare to potential losses that can come out of this type of rebalancing. And it, it gets even more complex for lending protocols. And Based like after getting under, understanding of these two, um, you know, if, if you're very serious about it, you also will be able to come up with the risk vectors that come up from this. So these are the components that can lead to losses. Uh, sometimes they could be to do regular market uh, activity, like impermanent losses just due to can be due to regular price movements or artificial market conditions that are generated by attackers. Uh, as I explained in the Oracle manipulation attack. And now let's take a look through these lens into how uh, these economic risks can be affected, uh, can affect uh, different types of protocols and what uh, institutions and protocols can do to mitigate these. So let's start with uh, AMMs, you know, arguably the most used uh, DeFi primitives, uh, Uniswap, um, you know, pioneer uh, of X times Y equals K uh, by introducing the, this peer to pool mechanism and, and the formula, uh, it managed to attract liquidity, but it created a problem that, you know, oftentimes people could be earning more, uh, like a higher return on investment if they simply hold those assets rather than if they invest, invest it in the pool. So that's why it's important to track those two. And the difference is essentially in permanent loss. Here, it's, it's a bit more unpredictable uh, since prices themselves are unpredictable. 
but you know the protocols can facilitate a way for users to track this and institutions can add a layer of intelligence on top to set like triggers of max tolerance of impermanent loss that, that they can accept. Uh, and then there's some more uh, specialized type of DAX uh, like Curve that, that use this stable swap invariant, uh, which is a lot more concentrated. So you can think about it like more leverage within a short range of liquidity. Uh, and uh, even though they're uh, primed for stable coins, Oftentimes, we've seen um, depegging events where the stable coins themselves are not as stable. So here we see, for instance, uh, with the USDC um, depegging upon the Silicon Valley Bank incident, it you know uh, USD versus USDT led to a depegging curve of about twelve percent against Dai of uh, four or five percent. Uh, and so this is another one of the um, examples where institutions can have a layer of intelligence to automatically exit if uh, those losses get to a point that they're not willing to tolerate. Uh, and the protocols themselves, of course, can create transparency by showing these metrics to users. There's even more complex mechanics uh, at play. Um, since providing liquidity to these protocols is a bit of a multiplayer game. So there's um, formulas that in, in Curve and other DEXs if you withdraw your liquidity, you can get an exit fee, which is essentially a slippage for withdrawing your position in one asset because the pool has multiple assets. In this case, this is an uh, ETH stake ETH pool. And if you choose to withdraw all your liquidity into ETH, you incur slippage. And that slippage depends, uh, is a function of the liquidity of the pool in general. So we have this uh, proprietary metric that we call exit fee evolution. And on the y-axis, we show the exit fee. So how much of a loss you would gain. Uh, you know, it starts relatively low. Um, and on the x-axis, sorry, we have the, the liquidity withdrawals from other players. So if, you know, one player has 50% of the pool and they withdraw their liquidity, uh, then suddenly your position, which is currently relatively small, would have a very high exit fee. So that's why it's important to understand you know the these mechanics and also the concentration into some of these top top addresses because if the pool is very highly concentrated and then they remove liquidity you're essentially and you're a liquidity provider you can get uh, burned pretty badly and lose a lot of your capital especially if it's in an asset that you're not willing to to exit so if it's like a stable coin versus um you know like USDC and a very very new stable coin pool uh, I would advise people, none of this is financial advice, but um, you should look at the, the concentration of these pools and how this exit fees would vary depending on the formulas. So this is one of the metrics that is publicly available um, for those looking to, to get access to this. Um, when it go comes to lending protocols, the, the most well-known type of risk for institutions to approach DeFi is, you know, liquidation. So say that you want to deposit uh, your Bitcoin and get leverage against it. Uh, it's very simple to get to borrow against it in protocols like Compound or Aave. Uh, and there, one of the key metrics is your health factor, which essentially is how close to liquidation uh, you are. Positions that go below one uh, of a health factor are effectively available to be liquidated. Uh, and so if you're in that case, in that position, you lose part of your collateral. Whereas positions with a high leverage factor of over two have more than twice the collateral before reaching that liquidation threshold. And a subsegment of these loans are what we classify as high risk loans, which are loans within 5% uh, of liquidation. And, you know, these can have an impact not just on the market prices, since those collateral assets are sold, but also in the protocol itself, uh, which brings us to like the more important um, risk factor that institutions and users in general should understand prior to using lending protocols, which is what is known as bad debt. And we get this term thrown around um, often within DeFi circles. What it essentially means is a loan that's unable to be repaid to depositors. So how lending protocols work is 
someone supplies liquidity on the lending side and another one, a borrower, borrows part of that liquidity at a higher rate than the lender gets. Um, and if uh, and they post collateral themselves to borrow that asset. If the value of the borrower's collateral drops below the liquidation threshold, which is you know over collateralized, then um, a liquidator sells part of their collateral and repays their debt. But if the profitability of these liquidations is negative, it they effectively have no incentive to rebalance the protocol. So this is why very it's very important to track the simulation, the the profitability simulation of these uh, loans. And if they drop below zero, you know it's a very a big problem for lending protocols, since in the case that there are liquidations that take place, essentially the depositors would not be made whole, as these debts wouldn't be repaid by liquidators. I I know this is complex and I see some comments in the chat and Q&A. So I'll, I'll explore this a bit and, and other things, of course, uh, later in the Q&A a bit more. Um, and finally, uh, the third category of DeFi protocols that we'll be discussing today are DeFi uh, stablecoins, so decentralized stablecoins. Uh, and these uh, I would pan out based on two metrics. So whether they are fully over collateralized or algorithmic relying on no collateral whatsoever. And if they're uh, backed you know, by their external assets or endogenously backed by their own liquidity, like in the case of Olympus DAO. Um, in the bear market, these all of these stable coins got battle tested um, and arguably the collateralized and externally backed were, were the ones that performed uh, the best. Uh, even Frax, which used to be more algorithmic, is now moving more into the collateralized uh, side of things and backed by treasuries even soon, uh, whereas the fully algorithmic and uh, endogenously backed uh, arguably failed. And you know, in in the middle, there's there's a bit of controversy of how those that are endogenously backed but collateralized do. So, uh, what are the risks for these? Um, essentially, it's a combination of the two previous categories that we discussed. So, collateralized debt position stablecoins like uh, makers die or uh, Aave's go uh, have to do with a lot of you know debt being emitted in the form of these stable coins and so uh, being over collateralized it's important to track the collateralization ratio of these stable coins if this drops below one then effectively the stable coin shouldn't retain its peg since it's it's got less backing than its asset so it's very important for these two to remain uh, over collateralized. And uh, over time, we've seen Go sustain quite high levels of uh, collateralization. But that being said, for those following uh, Go, that's not the whole uh, part. Like There's still other things necessary to preserve your peg. So uh, one thing is that people need to be able to rebalance their, uh, their debt such that there's not you know, just selling pressure. Uh, on the stablecoin. So Go itself has been performing at around like 97 cents or so since it, it, it started. And you can borrow at a very low cost. So partly is due to that, um, just because you can borrow at a low cost, it's, it's very cheap to deposit that asset into liquidity pools or swap it for another asset that earns yield like Maker's um, SDI um, that earns 5%. So it creates an uh, inherent imbalance that is reflected in the pool distribution. And so if someone looks to swap, this also makes it uh, less sturdy to preserve the peg than if these pools were 50-50 balanced, where there's a lot of uh, market depth that can be handling these transaction volume. So um, I went over it relatively quickly, so I'm happy to stick around for questions to uh, elaborate a bit further. <clears throat> But in general, we've established DeFi is risky. And not only is it risky, but the, a lot of the risks involved are risks that regular institutions from traditional finance are not used to dealing with. So it's it's important to understand these metrics, uh, be educated. This is something I need to block. We educate 
uh, clients about all the time and understand uh, the risks themselves and how to mitigate them, have an exit strategy for a lot of these. Um, we need better risk management, uh, both at the protocol level and at the allocator level to be able to attract uh, more institutions into the space. Uh, transparency helps significantly. Uh, it's one of the core competencies of DeFi to be able to get public data. So we should take advantage of it to create transparent metrics for anyone looking to deposit into the space to be more confident that you know uh, the protocols are monitoring these metrics and managing positions, managing uh, the protocol based on these levers. And finally, um, monitoring and automating a lot of the risk management makes DeFi more resilient. Uh, as I mentioned, I think this is something where we've come far and uh, over the next few years, we need to improve even more on automating as much risk vectors as, as possible, minimizing governance decisions and uh, making it more autonomous as a whole, rather than having a lot of human involvement uh, in these processes. So thank you guys for, for tuning in. Uh, make sure to sign up for the next webinar. We're going to be talking about BASE, which of course has been you know, one of the fastest growing ecosystems. Uh, we'll talk about what Coinbase is doing, what are the exciting applications within it, and opportunities that arise from, from this. So make sure to sign up. Uh, we just posted the link in the chat. So feel free to take a look at that. Uh, and now I'll be sticking around for a few questions. All right, so um, let's dive into these questions. <clears throat> will it be possible to download this presentation? Yes, we'll be posting uh, in our YouTube. We also post the slides. So I know there's a lot of data that we used in it that that's interesting. Um, at least it's for me, hopefully for you guys too. So we'll be sharing that in our social media. Um, what are some of the potential roles that you think AI can play in the management of risks in the DeFi landscape? Uh, it's a good question. And of course, DeFi and AI are, you know, some of the higher tech um, worlds that are colliding now. I think there's room for AI in two ways. Uh, one is in the development itself of these applications. So just how uh, we've studied a lot of the economic risk vectors and I explain these here uh, for the technical risk vectors are arguably AI is better since you know it learns what are the exploits that took place at the contract level and it can like through something like GitHub Copilot eventually you can envision uh, the AI telling you this code is uh, potentially vulnerable to a reentrancy attack or something like that. So I believe in the process of building applications, uh, AI will become significantly more ingrained. Uh, and uh, I think there's some startups building that. And then on the risk management side, uh, it could also be used to identify anomalies uh, in, in the process. That's what we've been doing at Into the Block. That's how we're looking to integrate it a bit further. Um, Josh was asking, can you simplify bad debt? So let me reshare my slides for, for this one. Uh, one second. Okay. Uh -huh. <clears throat> so the simplest word, word to describe bad debt is insolvency. And this is actually something that also applies to uh, traditional banks and not just lending protocols. But the way banks work uh, and lending protocols for that matter, is that they have depositors uh, that provide capital and then they have liabilities. In the case of lending protocols, uh, those liabilities are over collateralized. Um, and so the borrowers provide their collateral asset uh, and use that to borrow less than they supply. That being said, those collateral assets are often volatile. Uh, and so it's important that they keep a margin of safety such that um, the collateral is able to be sold to repay debt in case that you know the borrower just goes away. Um, and if 
you know, let's let's put an example. This might make it easier. Let's say you deposit one Bitcoin, which is uh, 25,000 and you borrow um, $10,000 USDC. Um, then your debt is fully over collateralized with a significant margin. Um, and then you, you're borrowing your USDC from someone that's depositing USDC and part of the interest that you pay goes to that depositor. So that's the incentive for both parties. Uh, like they're, the depositor is getting paid and you're able to get leverage on the borrower side. That being said, let's say, you know, Black Swan event, Bitcoins goes to 10,000 or 5,000. If it goes to 5,000, then you would be borrowing more than what you have as collateral. And in that case, you know, it, it doesn't make sense for you to tell the depositor, hey, I, I'll give you $5,000 to get $10,000 of USDC. So the collateral, the depositors are at a loss in that case. And that debt is unable to be repaid. Hence, depositors lose out on their deposits and the lending protocols themselves also lose a portion of the, the reserves, which is part of the debt that they've been, uh, that interest that they've been accumulating. So I, I hope that helps. Um, I know it's one of the more complicated risks, but that's why it's important for these positions to be uh, not just over collateralized, but profitable to liquidate. So if there's too much slippage, like let's say it's still like $12,000 worth of Bitcoin against $10,000 UCC liability. If there's 25% slippage, then there's no incentive to rebalance that debt and you would also accrue um, bad debt. Hope that clarifies your question, Joshua. Um, Piotrek is asking some DEXs and services in DeFi add some hidden fees and contracts. Do audits reveal them or are there other ways to track that? Um, it's a good question. I, I'm, I'm aware of these uh, DEXs and tokens. So the, the fee on transfer tokens are some of the more popular ones. Uh, generally, uh, these happen on the less battle-tested protocols. So one piece of advice is, you know, make sure to Go for battle-tested protocols that have been uh, used um, for for years, um, and review the documentation. So sometimes they might be hidden within the UI, but in the documentation they explain these a bit further. Um, some audits can say um, more than fees. I've seen audits uh, disclose that they have access, like the addresses have access to upgrade the contracts and potentially withdraw funds. Um, but fees, I'm like if they're hidden fees, I imagine some audit reports would also uh, disclose those. Um, but yeah, generally I would look for, for uh, documentation on, on the protocols before using them. Um, uh, Rushi is asking, can you elaborate more on the core pillars for institutional DeFi? Yes. So I'll, I'll present again. Um, okay, and uh, no, this one. So there's crypto native institutions that frankly are not too familiar with DeFi, but are familiar with crypto. So those are easier to get on board. It's harder to get traditional finance institutions to use DeFi. There's advantages in the permissionless nature of DeFi that can make it very attractive for anyone to, you know, get a loan on the spot very quickly, for example, or provide liquidity to a market and earn yield. So the financial incentives are there, but the risk side is weighing down a lot of the industries looking to get into the space. And so to help with these risks, um, what we believe are the three main pillars uh, that help this are transparency, which you know can be done through the through dashboards of these metrics, uh, explaining so or educating also in the process of on why these metrics are relevant, and how the protocol is doing in relation to these metrics, uh, and so that way you know people can get comfortable that the protocol is currently secure and managing things as intended. That's the first pillar in my opinion. Uh, then there's the protocol risk management which should be you know, thought out from the inception of the protocol, but also iterated as the 
the protocol evolves. So this is uh, not just monitoring the risk conditions, but acting on them. Uh, I think initially it was a lot to do with governance and uh, implementing changes, but we're transitioning to a bit more automated risk management, which is a lot more secure uh, over the, the long haul. Um, so it's important for the protocol to deeply understand these risks and be able to uh, take actions uh, automatically to be able to mitigate those risks for, for their users. And that should attract more institutions that you know can can show see the track record of these protocols uh, managing risk properly and finally uh, there's a layer of intelligence on top um, that uh, we add into the block offer to some institutions and you know we're not the only players in this so uh, it's we see it as a valuable uh, vertical for any institution getting to DeFi of having their own customized risk parameters to be able to exit uh, a protocol or rebalance uh, their debt or rebalance their AMM positions to mitigate potential losses. Uh, and that as a whole should make DeFi more resilient and sturdy. Uh, I think we're towards that path. Um, and if we get to solidify these pillars, you know, by the next five years, uh, DeFi should get into the trillions of uh, TVL so a bit of opium there for you guys as well. Um, okay, last question. Um, so is it possible to create a metric capable of analyzing the addresses that create pools in order to estimate the risk of a rock pool? Uh, so this is a bit more nuanced question because the the contracts and the rock pool risk uh, varies a lot from protocol to protocol. So the the main thing is, you know, who controls the keys to the protocol um, and how can those be, what permissions those keys have. It gets very technical. Um, so it's hard to create a generalized metric for all protocols because they have different smart contracts. Uh, I think over time, this is one of the things that AI can also help identify that, you know, uh, the permissions that any protocol, any contract deployed has and the owners, how can they access that? In general, more than a metric, uh, I would suggest reviewing the documentation, making sure that they have a, a multi-sig setup and not just any multi-sig, but ideally, uh, you know, a lot of people involved in the multi-sig and external entities as well, not just internal entities. Uh, hopefully, ideally, some of them not anonymous as well, so that they have a track record of being a trustworthy person um, and being able to monitor any movements in these addresses. Um, that's the, the best way to make sure that a protocol won't or is very unlikely to rock pull you. Um, Anyways, uh, I appreciate uh, anyone tuning in, everyone tuning in. Uh, thank you guys for the thoughtful questions, uh, and we hope to see you in the next one. Have a good day, everyone. Thanks.